I now call Senator McGrath to make his first speech and ask that honourable senators extend the usual courtesies to someone giving their first speech. Senator yeah. McGrath. Yeah. Yeah. Freedom and liberty 100 years ago this month were under threat as the gods of war awoke. Armies of empires stretching back before the Middle Ages were slowly moving to Armageddon. A world war with deaths of millions, the end of four royal houses and the beginning of wicked new orders of communist and fascist cruelty. This war ended realms of geography but brought in dominions of political terror, imprisoning generations under dictatorship, ending hope, freedom and liberty for many until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Indeed, the war that began in 1914 with the invasion of Belgium was the Second Hundred Year War, the war against tyranny, continuing from the armistice, pausing in 1989 and continuing and resuming in 2001 in New York. The Hundred Year War against tyranny continues today on three fronts. First of all, Islamist fundamentalists intent on caliphates, destroying Western civilization, especially religious freedom. Secondly, democratic governments restricting freedom of speech and association, betraying hundreds of years of liberty. And finally, leftists delegitimising all views other than their own, especially in media and education. Freedom and liberty are not abstract concepts. You either have freedom or you are not free. Whether I serve here for 16 days or 16 years, I shall always judge myself on how I have battled against tyranny and fought for the axis of enlightenment, that is, liberty of the individual, a free market, small government and low taxes. I will let others badge and brand and box me, as in my great broad church that is the Liberal Party, my pew is a movable feast. I have campaigned against dictator-loving Islamist fundamentalists in the Maldives. Sinn Féin, PLO, Labor candidates in London, godless rebranded communists in Mongolia, not to mention the Queensland branch of the Australian Labor Party. <laughs> My life has not been about the pursuit or gain of power, but to confiscate power back from government to free people. My story is not special or unique. I come from the great blancmange that is the Australian middle class. Families are modest and shy. They are joiners and doers, workers and strivers, not shirkers. Our homes aren't big and flash, and cars often second-hand. The biggest investment is never super or bricks or shares, but education. My mob are farmers, they're saddlers, they're soldiers and gardeners, small business owners, nurses, teachers, doctors, shamefully the odd lawyer. One side are stridently Labor and Unionist, the other cheerfully Liberal, National and Tory. The first McGraw was a convict rightly punished by a sensible judge and sent down to Australia. Family folklore has it was for stealing a sheep. On my mother's side, the Schneiders and Doherty's, the first to arrive was German, illegitimate, with barely a word of English, and he moved to Western Queensland in the 1870s. His son, my great-grandfather, patented the Schneider saddle, and his store stood on George Street in Brisbane till the 1970s. Schneiders would become guests of the Emperor, caught in the fall of Singapore, on the way to fight the Nazis. Like many, my journey started young. I worked on my first Liberal campaign in the 1989 Queensland state election. I started the Capitalist Club at Toowoomba State High School a year later. When 17, continuing my quest to become the most popular kid at school, I led the campaign to save the school principal when the new Queensland <laughs> Labor government engaged in some restructuring. Our school community was the only one to actively campaign for their principal's retention. Our school community was the only one whose principal was eventually made redundant. <laughs> I learnt early on that you can be right in life but still lose in politics. Politics is not about the pursuit of power as an end in itself. Those who seek power for the sake of power will always fail. Politics is about seeking power through democratic means in order to take power away from elites with a bureaucratic or corporate and return power to the people. I've been lucky in politics. I don't think I'm that good at politics, but I do learn from my mistakes, personal and political. I've made a few, some spectacularly so, and I've learned from some wise mentors. As along my journey, I've been fortunate to work with some erudite people here in Australia and overseas. I believe there are 11 principles of power in politics that should guide me as I work for Queensland, 
and all principles were taught to me or learnt from my own mistakes. And I start with the greatest ever peacetime leader, Margaret Thatcher. I never met Mrs Thatcher, but I get her. I get that someone from a corner store in a small market town could be so strong to rise so high, not just in making decisions, but holding fast to her underlying values, because she had to fight for everything. And she said, you may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. Likewise, the moral courage of my friend Mohammed Nasheed, former president of the Maldives, who taught me the power of forgiveness. A former political prisoner, an Amnesty International prisoner of conscience, he forgave those who jailed and tortured him. I fail this principle. As much as I try, I cannot forgive and I will never forget how communist and fascist regimes incarcerated generations through political terror. Che Guevara, Castro, Chavez aren't freedom fighters. They're murderers, common thugs and torturers, destroyers of hope. But I do have a confession to make. While working for the British Tories, I fell in love, and I'm big enough to admit it, with a man called Eric. Eric Pickles, a Tory MP, former Conservative Party chairman, and now British Cabinet Minister. One of those rotund, Rubenesque, larger than life Yorkshiremen whose method of elucidating his garbled tongue was to just shout at me and call me Skippy. <laughs> Eric, as a consummate MP and grassroots councillor, taught me all politics is local and timing matters. With local elections in the UK around spring, Eric would always ensure that spring bulbs and flowers would be in full glory in the weeks leading up to polling day to present his council his best. Another Tory minister, Francis Maud. Incidentally, his father was editor of the Sydney Morning Herald before serving Mrs Thatcher in her cabinet. It wouldn't happen nowadays, would it, Fairfax? <laughs> Taught me to pick your fights, and parties should never be afraid to change or stand up for a fight. I've worked on a few campaigns with the greatest campaign duo going, Mark Texter and Lyndon Crosby. Their main focus is always be honest and stand for your beliefs and stick to them as you communicate with voters as message matters. Likewise, former Territory Chief Minister Shane Stone taught me to be humble and constantly deliver on my promises. It's what people hear, not what you say, was drummed into me when I worked for the Tory party as a pretty average media advisor, especially by my good friend Gavin McGaw, who was always appalled when I speak to the media, as it normally never ends well for me. James Dillon was an inconsequential Irish politician of the mid-20th century. His inconsequence came about because of a statement of principle that democracy, freedom and liberty must always be defended. A third generation Irish parliamentary nationalist, his view was that the Irish Free State should put aside disputes with Britain and support her against the Nazis. In 1942, he was the only Irish MP to do so. He was expelled by his own party and pilloried by the Irish Free State. My old boss, Boris, as Mayor of London, one of the great wordsmiths of the modern political age is living proof that you should not dumb down to voters. The man who twice won the largest direct election in Western Europe, outside of France, thanks to a bit of Australian help, uses poetry, the classics and an oversized vocabulary to speak to Londoners. After I was elected, I went and saw Campbell Newman and I asked him how I could help him in Queensland. And instead of a detailed discussion on federation and taxes and the federal budget, Mr Treasurer, he just said, be good and do good. And finally from Lord Ashcroft, I'll always trust the people and treat issues seriously, but never take myself seriously. I'm going to use these principles to deliver on a better deal for Queensland, and this starts with the Federation. The Federation of Australia is slowly creaking a political death. Successive governments have taken power and decisions from the states. The best government is in a federation where power is split between different levels of government taking power from the states and away from local communities must be stopped. To bring about competitive or market federalism between the states, we need to sort out the tax system and bring in taxes that don't punish ambition and productivity or continue to centralise power in Canberra. A low tax structure that is simple, clear and transparent. Taxes on jobs and productivity, such as the payroll tax and company tax, must be abolished and reduced respectively. To cover the states for the loss of income from payroll tax, the GST should be broadened to cover everything, and the GST should also be increased to 15 per cent. Of course, there should be compensation for the less well-off and income tax cuts. Tide grants should be 
should be abolished, with states to decide the priorities. A proportion of income taxes should be allocated to each state, with those states that push growth to be doubly rewarded with more jobs and more revenue. The yin to the yang of low tax is small government, government that trusts people to make their own decisions. In Australia today, the growth and centralisation of government at a federal level is a clear and present danger to our federation and the individual. We have a federal health department with thousands of staff, but they don't manage a single hospital or treat a single patient. The federal education department also has thousands of staff, but they don't look after a single school or teach a single student. Bureaucracies have become more bloated, more process-driven and more out of touch. The states run the hospitals and schools. Why do we need to be involved? I'm calling for the abolition of the federal departments of health and education, with universities also to be run at a state level. And each year I'll be compiling my own red tape report to keep my government and my party on the Hayek road away from serfdom to lower regulation to lower taxes and smaller government. As someone who grew up in regional Queensland, I grew up with the ABC. But the ABC has left people like me and my constituents behind. I want to support the ABC. I like the ABC. Yet while it continues to represent only inner-city leftist views, while funded by taxes, it is in danger of losing its social licence to operate. I'm calling for a review of the charter of the ABC. And if they fail to make inroads to restore balance, then the, ABC should, uh, then, then the ABC should be sold and replaced by a regional and rural broadcasting service. In the meantime, Triple J, because of its demographic dominance and clear ability to stand on its own, should be immediately sold. This year in February, I laid a wreath at the Brisbane Cenotaph to commemorate the fall of Singapore. With only six former prisoners of war of the Japanese left in Queensland, we should always honour and help those who did so much to defend our liberty in this hundred-year war against tyranny. I ask Labor and the minor parties and the crossbenchers to work with me to bring forward, based on the British model, a covenant between Australia and the Defence Forces and their families. The ongoing commitment of the men and women who have served or are serving in the Defence Force, along with the sacrifices of their families, is worthy of formal recognition by way of a covenant that supports their families. Like many on this side, I am a graduate of the greatest political training school in this country, the Young Liberal Movement and the Australian Liberal Students Federation, yeah. both, both strong voices for freedom of association and liberty of thought. Compulsory student unionism, or SAP as it is now called, is an attack on the fundamental freedom of association. <laughs> students, students, like anyone, should have the freedom to decide themselves whether or not they join a student body or union. I give notice I'll be moving a private member's bill to abolish the SAP and bring back true voluntary student unionism, and I hope all freedom lovers will join me in supporting this bill. Likewise, freedom of speech should never be restricted by government because when freedom of speech is regulated in any manner, speech is no longer free. People will say hurtful and bigoted and stupid and dumb things. People will make racist and sexist and homophobic comments. The views are wrong, but the right to express them is not. If you believe in democracy, you cannot cleanse it of the views you disagree with. The true test of a democratic nation is not how we treat those with whom we agree, but how we treat the rights of those with whom we disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The best way to deal with those with whom you disagree is not to force them into the dark shadows, but let the sun shine. Let the disinfectant of light and public scrutiny judge those offensive views. From the dockyards of Kronstadt to the editorial desk of the age, the left always want to control and brutalise. By restricting freedom of speech, they are building Australian gulags for words and thoughts. The Australian people are a pretty sensible bunch. They always make the right decisions when it comes to elections. They elected everyone in this chamber, and I trust them always to make the correct judgment response rather than calling in the thought police. Each day I wake and I give thanks. I know I'm here because a lot of people over the years did a lot to help me, so please bear with me. I give thanks to the voters of Queensland. I'll be a humble but strong advocate for my home state. I give thanks for being raised with my sister Emma, who I thank and her and her husband Anthony, and by my parents, who, while short of money, were never short of honesty, goodness or encouragement. And happy birthday to my nana, the last of her line, daughter, wife and, farmer, and mother of farmers and a farmer herself who turns a sprightly 97 today. Amen. I give thanks to having friends, whether from uni to the Young Liberals or to the Marquess of Granby, a great pub in London, 
here and overseas who put up with me being grumpy and the worst friend in replying to texts, emails and phone calls, and for my love and sometimes overindulgence of Bundy rum. I give thanks to all my friends for helping me, especially Rebecca Smith for helping and organise today. To Toby, Tess and Rosie and their parents, Gavin and Helen, thank you for keeping it real. It's been 10 years since I was best man at their wedding and forgot the rings in the speech. <laughs> to Bruce McIver, Gary Spence and the State Executive and State Council of the LNP, thank you for your support. And to Brad Henderson and all the LNP staff and volunteers at headquarters, thank you for helping me. To Estee and Jamie Briggs, to Scott Ryan, Simon Birmingham and Tony Barry, thank you for helping me. And to White Roy and Joan Carroll Humphreys, thank you for taking me to the pub at Palmwoods and twisting my arm to convince me to run for the Senate. <laughs> I do give thanks to the Liberal Party and the Liberal National Party and the thousands of party members and supporters who helped in my election. There are too many members and friends from here and overseas in the gallery this afternoon to thank by name. But thank you all for coming down. I look forward to having some Cheerios and a Bundy or three with you later. I give thanks to the young LNP in Queensland for being not just roadside warriors, letterbox stuffers and student union victors, but true bearers of the flame of liberty and freedom. I give thanks to those who I follow. In my own political memory, I wear the shoes of Sue Boyce, Seno Santoro and John Heron, all unique and strong contributors to public life in Australia, and I hope I live up to their political inheritance. I should also acknowledge Ron Boswell and Russell Trude in the gallery. I thank all my fellow Queensland LNP Senate candidates, led by Senator Macdonald, who entered this chamber when I was still in high school, and who advised me the other day to do as he says but not as he does. Um, <laughs> Ian, thank you for your support, and Senator Canavan for your friendship and good luck in a few minutes' time. To Senators Brandis and Mason, thank you for your guidance, and to Senator O'Sullivan, Irish eyes are smiling at the two of us here together. And I'd like to acknowledge Amanda Stoker, Theresa Craig and David Goodwin for their candidature during the 2012 and 2013 campaign. Mr President, I congratulate you on your election and I thank you, the Clerk of the Senate, the Usher of the Black Rod and everyone in this building for your help in, in helping my, myself and my team settle into the Senate. I started my speech in 1914 and I'll conclude in the 1940s over the skies of Nazi-occupied France. The Royal Air Force dropped the French a poem called Liberté by Paul Eloard, a poet not of my politics, I confess. I will end as I close with its final stanzas. On passionless absence, on naked solitude, on the marches of death I write your name, on health that's regained, on danger that's past, on hope without memories I write your name. By power of the word I regain my life, I was born to know you and to name you Liberty. Mm. Well, well, well.